Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and today we have a very special guest with us, Larry Hankin, who has been in projects I cannot even start to name. We're going to get into them as we go on. Larry, thank you so much for being our guest today. How are you doing? Uh, so far, so good. <laughs> that's that's great to hear. I got, thank you again for joining us. So let's just get started right away. You are you have several movies coming out, but I think the next one scheduled for release is uh, The Eden Theory, um, where you play a character by the name of Farmer Joe, I believe. So what can you tell us about The Eden Theory and your character in the movie? Well, it's really a simple character. I mean, it's not... Uh, I just did it as a favor for a friend. It's a one-day shoot. It's a farmer who... Uh, um, some kids are working on my farm and I just, um, I just holler at them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I want them to do work they don't want to do. It, 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 and that's it. So uh, I, I just watched uh, Kyle uh, direct, which is why I wanted to. Kyle is a cool uh, director uh, who lives up north. So every once in a while, I'll go up there and just do something for him because he's a good guy. That's awesome. Just to name off some of the titles uh, that you've been on, both TV and movies, you've been in going back to like Escape from Alcatraz on TV. You've been on hit shows like Friends. Of course, a lot of people know you as Old Joe from Breaking Bad. Uh, so let's just, uh, I want to ask you, when you go onto the set, uh, whether it's for uh, a single episode or a reoccurring character on a big hit show, what is the difference as opposed to another project that's not quite as popular, big budgeted, and whatnot? Suits. <laughs> the more money, the more suits are hanging around, making making judgment. <laughs> then they go upstairs to their their office, their big office that look, overlooks LA. Uh, that's about the only difference, really. Uh, the money involved. The more money, the more suits. A lot of oversight. The more suits. <laughs> it's, it's really, I, when I did, uh, was it uh, Friends, Mister? Uh, no, Huckles. Kramer. No, no. When I did, when I did Kramer. When oh, okay. I did, uh, Seinfeld. Uh, so I had to imitate. Basically, I just had to imitate Michael Richards' character, Kramer. And claim that I was him. Yeah. My character was Tom Pepper. So you know, we rehearse. You rehearse four days. You shoot two shows on the fifth day. So I was rehearsing all for four days, and then the fifth day, um, what they did was um, they had. Uh, well, there was no audience. There was no audience uh, for the for the one because they wanted to shoot two shows in a row. Okay. So that was the only show where both shows were shot on the same day because it's uh less expensive mm -hmm. to shoot you know one scene then shoot the next week's scene in the same set at the same time or one right after the other blah 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 so there was nobody there but i remember as soon as uh so there's no suits around the whole four days and the entire day of, of shooting you know for camera on the fifth day, on Friday, until my scene showed up, where I was going to imitate Kramer. Uh huh. I remember that. And uh, I, I start to walk toward. I was up in my dressing room where I was, didn't where wasn't watching. And they say, "Hey, you're up. You know, get onto the set." So I walk onto the set, and as I'm walking onto the set, four suits walk onto the set out of nowhere, out of the darkness, <laughs> out of the big building upstairs, God knows where, and they just stood at the edge of the edge of the set you know off camera and they just crossed their arms across their chest and they just stood there waiting for the for the scene to start you know and direct yells action and i do the scene and then he yells cut okay moving on and everybody moved on and the scene suits disappeared so i went over and i asked it to the i, I asked somebody i don't know who some regular, not, not a cast member, but a crew member or a manager yeah. or something. And I said, what was that all about? Yeah. You know, I didn't see suits for five days, for four and a half days. All of a sudden I get on set 
and they show up, cross their arms, watch, they don't react, and then when the, my scene's over, they just split. What was that all about? No. You were um, imitating Kramer. Around here, Kramer is a franchise. Ooh. And uh, so they were just watching to uh, see that you don't fuck up their franchise. <laughs> oh, okay, thank you. So that's the difference. <clears throat> when you saw those suits pop out, I mean, you're, you're a veteran. It didn't spook you, throw you off no, your game. No, no, no. I just, I knew something was different. But, but for somebody to come down all the way and not show up for rehearsal, you know, that's uh, like an insult. Yeah, yeah. Not, it's like an insult. So I had... So, you know, I don't need much. I mean, I have an attitude to begin with. So, I mean, it doesn't <laughs> take much to just light my little fuse. You know, and, uh, what the fuck, man? What was that all about? You know, oh, they just came down to make a judgment call on what you were doing. Unbelievable. You know, show up for four and a half days, screw them. You know, you... I mean, uh, so that's when I finally got out, you know. Years later, I, I stuck around because the money is good. Yeah. The money is good, and when you get in front of a camera and get a role, like, I didn't look at it as imitating Kramer. I mean, I looked at it as uh, it was just a challenge, a dare. I knew that Kramer was famous, and I just wanted to see if I could pull this off. And when I auditioned, you know, I, I, I kind of, not out loud, but in my head, I thanked Larry David and... Uh, Jerry Seinfeld for, for for throwing a challenge at me yeah. and hiring me to do it. So you brought... I loved it. I, I was looking forward to it, you know. And then all of a sudden, these suits show up, and I got them. <laughs> that is odd. You brought up a great point with the live audience bit. That has gone away. People don't remember today, you know, back in the 80s, 90s, sitcoms were shot in front of a live audience. In fact, some of the shows before they started, they there was an announcement, you know, shot in front of a live well, audience. No, wait a minute. No, wait a minute. There is a difference. A sitcom is, is generally shown in front of an audience. They, they want the laugh track. They really do. I, I mean, if, if the audience doesn't laugh, where they think they should laugh, they'll, they'll sweeten it, you know, which is called sweeten it. They yeah. Laugh track. So now every once in a while, a dramedy doesn't, like, you know, this is us. Yeah. You no, know, that's a dramedy. It's an hour. You can't ask uh, a, a, a studio audience to sit for an hour and, and just watch and laugh or not. And then to do a second show it's uh it's tough it is uh to do an hour show twice in one day in front of an audience and then they're sitting there for an hour and then changing over so if it's a half hour sitcom you're going to get an audience is that still right. done today oh yeah okay oh yeah i oh, thought yeah. they did away with it you know uh so no, i don't know sometimes you know if it's a all, all it is, is it a one camera or a three camera? That's all you have to ask. Yeah. If it's a one camera, it's a no audience. If it's a three camera, it's an audience. That, that's sort of the only difference. But the time, if it's an hour, pretty much then no audience. Okay, um, gotcha. But it's a dramedy. It, uh, comedies are, but, but uh, yeah, that, that's it. I got you. I got you. So let's move on to one of the, the roles that really, really got your name out there in the, in the blockbuster hit and that is breaking bad again you play somebody named joe uh apparently you know uh people look at you and you're like you're a joe anyway you play old joe in breaking bad you did several episodes you appeared in the follow-up movie el camino so uh what were your feelings towards your character in breaking bad old joe uh what did you think about him i thought if i get this part I'll be working for Vince Gilligan. That's what I thought. <laughs> That's all I thought. I mean, because he's a great writer, man, and he's got great ideas, and his characters are just so quirky and weird. So, uh, I, you know, and, and also, uh, I just like playing old Joe. He was well written, and, and I like that kind of character. And also, it fit with my Uncle Murray. I have an Uncle Murray. Who, that, who was like old Joe. Uh, so I, I just wanted to do it for, for Uncle Murray's sake. Now, I just was doing Uncle Murray. Refresh my memory. Uh, when we are introduced to old Joe in Breaking Bad, it's in that scene where they take the camper into the junkyard and they're being followed by Dean Norris's character, Hank. 
Uh, and of course, Hank doesn't know that Brian Cranston, Walter White, his brother-in-law is in there. And you come out and you present uh, the DEA with this, you know, constitutional language about search and seizure and the mobile home being a home. Uh, that, that was brilliant. And that stuck with so many people. I loved it. I loved that line. I loved that introduction. What did you think of that, that dialogue when you read the script on how you were going to be brought into the show? I thought it was too long for me to memorize. They gave that to me right before I went on. They wow. Gave it to me two hours before I went on. So I didn't memorize it at all. I just improvised. That that's that speech is improvised. I improvised it. I did not know that. Well you did a great job and I obviously no, they... I, mean, I I had the I had what I had to say in the intent of, of the scene written down. I mean, it was a, it was a it was a page long speech. So I try to memorize it, you know, but I couldn't. I, I'm, I'm dyslexic, and a lot of the actors are, but I just don't want to put in the work. I mean, it just, it takes a terrific amount of time and energy to memorize uh, if you're dyslexic. I can and imagine. most actors will put in the time. But I don't have the fire in the belly, man. I don't care if I'm an actor or not. The what? money was good, and I liked the parts I was auditioning for. I what? wanted to do them. Because I thought I could do them. Well, maybe but, that, that's uh, that's why old Joe and his introduction and that speech that you gave resonated with so many fans. It's because you did improvise it to some degree, and it felt real, authentic, and you nailed it. So congratulations. You did a great job on that. So getting to work with Vince Gilligan, was it and was it everything you thought it would be? Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, he's a good guy. He's a good guy, and he's, uh, but he knows what, and, and he knows what he wants, and he tries to get it as, as, as hard as he can, you know, he, little OCD there, which is great, which is fine if you're a director. If you're Vince Gilligan, it's fine. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and he, and he doesn't give, he doesn't direct. I mean, no, no. all the great, all the great directors don't direct actors that's not what they're there for they're, they're there to to uh work with the cinematographer and the story the, the, the writer mm -hmm. and the intent of, of the scene they don't bother with the actors john houston said it best he said 80 percent of a director's job is hiring the Casting. right actors exactly and well, getting out of the way hire the right actors you leave them alone and yep. you, Deal with what you've got to do, you know, get the right shot, the mood, the quality, the lighting, talk to the cinematographer, you know, can, can tell the story, man, tell the story. Absolutely. And I've heard that before, too. A director, once you cast the, the actor, just let them do their thing. You casted them for a purpose, get out of their way. And help them get to where they want to go. That's what Larry David did with me <laughs> in, a, in a very funny way. He's, I mean, he's, he's great. Larry David, uh, that was for Seinfeld, because my idea for uh, doing Larry, uh, Tom Pepper, the, the character who is then going to imitate Kramer, so I was doing a character in a character. I just yeah. love the challenge. Uh, it just turned me on. So uh, my, ca my idea was Buster Keaton. I thought uh, um, Tom Pepper, the character, Tom Pepper... It's passive aggressive, mm -hmm. I thought. Just the way it was written. I don't know. That's just what I saw. So I thought, well, Buster Keaton would be about as passive aggressive you could think. It's just his stone face, you know, and then um, and he just gets mad at Costanza for saying something, you know, <laughs> and he telling him, I didn't steal the raisins. Yeah. But he was, you know, blah, blah, blah. but other than that, I want to do that. So, it, Larry David stands on the side and he just watches. He's not the director of the show. Yeah. He's the writer producer. But when when he gets an idea, he'll call you over. He'll say, you know, excuse me, Tom. Tom is also the name of the director of the show, like mm -hmm. a traffic manager for cameras and stuff. And he would tell you where to stand. So Larry David said, I cut. I want to talk to Larry. So and he would do that. He'd cut and he said, come over here and he'd take your side and he'd say, listen, blah blah blah. So he pulls me aside and he says. 
All he said was, because he was pulling the other actors aside, the regulars, and he would just whisper something to them, and then he would go back into the scene, and they would be funnier. <laughs> I mean, it just, and he did that about three times during the whole week and during the, the shoot. He would go, and they go in and blah, 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 blah. Oh, hey, that's pretty funny. So I was waiting for him to say, why doesn't he talk to me? I want a little of that yeah. of funny dust, you know? And finally he did, he calls me over. So I'm, you know, waiting. And he and all he does is he goes, I know what you're trying to do. That was the little secret he pulled me aside and said, I know what you're trying to do. And he said it with an attitude. And like I say, I oh, you're gonna give me an attitude? I don't care who you are. I said some attitude. So I said, Oh really? And what am I trying to do? And he goes, You're trying to do nothing. Which is exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to be, you know, Buster Keaton. And I, it just blew my mind. I was very so surprised that he caught me. So I went, oh, yeah, I got very excited. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to do. But but the key word was trying. I got insulted about the trying. I get insulted very easily <laughs> <laughs> So about my work. So I said, oh, and he goes, yeah, yeah, so I really. So then he leans in and he goes, well, you're doing something. And then he walked away. And I thought that's the greatest piece of direction I've ever gotten. He wasn't telling me what to do. He wasn't directing me, just telling me what I was doing and it wasn't what I wanted to do. That's all he was doing. Oh, that's just brilliant. Something to me. Yeah, it was, it was. So I just, you know, took it down a notch, took it back a notch even more. So, you know, it worked, but he was right on. Yeah, he that... said it in such a way, you know, just cool, man. Yeah. So, so the director is what, what the director's job is to be the actors in movies mainly is just help the actor get to where he wants to go once you've chosen him for the part you want him to play. Absolutely. Now, you have been on so many different sets like we've discussed. Uh, it seems like Kramer has a very special place in your heart. Uh, besides Kramer, whether it's Breaking Bad, Friends, or the countless other shows and movies that you've done what else really stands out as a really great experience for you oh uh, working in uh uh escape from alcatraz really that, that was a, my first big time movie yeah you know really a lot of, a lot of <laughs> well luckily we were working on uh alcatraz island so you had to get up at like six o'clock in the morning to catch the boats, for the yeah. two of boats, because there was two hundred, you know, extras, uh, uh, prisoners. Mm -hmm. So no suits would get up that early to get on a boat <laughs> to an island. So the, the the water, San Francisco Bay, kept the suits at bay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah, so there's no suits around at all. It was just really great. And then. The, I remember Don Siegel, I was working with him, who was a classic director from the old days, from the black and white days. He finally, I, I would always follow him around, uh, asking questions. Uh, you know, like, why are you doing this? Where are you putting the camera? You know, because I was just curious. I would just follow him around. So he kind of adopted me as his grandson. You know, he was a, a nice old a elder gentleman. He wasn't an old man at all. He was yeah. an elder gentleman. He was just wonderful. And so he kind of saw that I was following around, asking a lot of questions. So he just, you know, he put me on, or he put me in a lot of scenes. Like for instance, here's a weird, a weirdness. I've never seen this in Hollywood at all. Uh, so we, I did that for the whole movie. I followed him around. And uh, sometimes he would just look at me and shrug and say, I don't know. I probably will get fired. I, I don't, you know, he just wouldn't tell me because I was asking so many questions. So at, at the end, well, finally one day he said, and also uh, Bruce Surtees, who was the cameraman, was on the verge of getting fired every day, man. They would get a call saying, his rushes are too black, they're too dark. So Clint Eastwood and Don Siegel would call Bruce Surtees the prince of darkness. <laughs> because he had a lot of dark shadows. That, yeah. Not, not that the screen was dark, but he always had dark shadows somewhere. And what it did was it gave it a sense of, I don't know, mystery and also depth. You know, black gives depth to the screen. Yeah. You know? So he was really a great 
you know, super duper cameraman, man, a cinematographer. He knew what he was doing. But Clint and Don Siegel stood up for him, and they said, "Hey, you fire him. We we walk." I mean, that, that's what they were saying. You got it. So the suits. I mean, so they didn't like the suits either. This was on the phone. And then one day, uh, Don Siegel came to me. And he's, I, I was asking him, you know, why are you putting, you know, why do you do that here? I was thinking, you know, I'm telling you, I was thinking of putting the camera over here. Why are you doing that? And he said, no, oh, well, uh, I, I just want to do it over here. Because he, sometimes he just wouldn't tell me. <laughs> he said, oh, I just want to put it over here. I think, I think it looks good over here. He said, but, you know, I said, well, you know, are you going to get fired for putting it over there? He said, no, no. Finally, you know, they stopped worrying about Bruce Surti, so I can put the camera wherever I want. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we're, we're past, we're long past, we're, you know, wondering if I'm going to get fired or not. Yeah, because, so you guys can breathe they easily. On the phone. They said, the, the suits left me alone. They, they said, we can do anything we want. All of a sudden, the, the rushes, because they were sending the rushes down to L.A., and they were screening them. He said, the rushes were looking great. Because I guess the editors were saying, hey, this stuff is really cool, what Bruce Surtees was doing. Uh -huh. So they just shut the suits up. Good. Know? So they said, hey, do whatever you want. You know, It's looking good. It's looking good. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, you know, you know the, the suits, the studio executives, when they try to mingle into the creative yeah. process, it creates a problem. It, it does. Here you have... um, yeah, unfortunately, if it does create a problem, they're the only ones who are going to solve it. If it's a problem and they go, say, hey, just do it this way. You got to do it this way, you know, except if you're Don Siegel and uh, Clint Eastwood and they say, hey. We're walking. Exactly. Yeah. You know, just, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, you know, there, there's certain, you know, pecking orders down there. Absolutely. And, uh, Everybody has a title. That was the other thing. Yeah. Just everybody's a casting. Everybody's a director. There's a casting director. There's a lighting director. There's an assistant director. Yeah. There's a director, director. Oh, yeah. yeah. Titles Everyone. all over the place. A writing guy. Absolutely. And it's great. I, I loved working there because I got to walk around Alcatraz Island. I got to be uh, down into the bowels. of. I got to get down to where... Uh, Alcatraz Island was. I kept on going down because I had a lot of time off. Yeah. Oh, but this is the, the point I wanted to tell you about that. They, they got a, a, a Clint Eastwood and uh, Don Siegel were so in control. It was looking so good, and they left him alone. They said, "Hey, do whatever you want. It's great. It's great." So that um, finally, uh, Don Siegel, because I was hanging around a lot, he would tell me. Get in the scene, Larry. Just get in the scene. I go, you know, what am I doing? It doesn't matter. Just get in there. Well, why am I in there? I just need another body in there. Just get in there. <laughs> so I was all, every day I was in another scene that I wasn't written for, but I would always get on the, getting on the, getting on the boat, waking up, even if I wasn't, you know, going to shoot that day, I would go to the set every day. That's you know, great. I just, yeah. So he, cause I just, I loved the whole thing. It was like a circus to me. It was yeah. a circus. You know, and then since I didn't have to memorize my many lines, yeah. uh, I could just walk around. I could watch them, you know, act. I could watch them produce. I could watch them, or I could explore Alcatraz. And I finally got down to where the Indians were. Remember in the 60s, the Indians took over the island yes. Yes. for about three months. Well, what they were doing was they were sleeping in the cells. They brought sleeping bags. But they would go down into the bowels of the ship, or oh, ship, into the yeah. bowels of the prison. And they would go down to the cellar. And the cellar was the ground of Alcatraz Island. And the, 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 the prison was built on it. So when you go down into the cellar, you were walking on Alcatraz Island. You know, just gray dirt. I had a flashlight. There's no lights down there. Yeah. I had a flashlight. That's how big a production was. Wow. That sounds, that, I, that's amazing. And I went over to, I said, I said, uh, you know, because I was always in costume, because he was telling me, you know, get in the scene. So it was just, you know, shirt, shirt, pants, and, and shoes. So it, he, um, he said, uh, oh, what was it? Then? So, oh, yeah. So I, I wanted to go exploring, and I knew I would need a flashlight, because I was going to go down, mm -hmm. uh, you know. 
So I went to the, uh, they had the uh, prop department sent to the island. So they didn't have to, you know, send a boat to the, you know, mainland to yeah. get, you know, a prop. So they shipped everything that they would think they would need out to the island. And there was this prop department on, you know, tier B. So I went down and uh, so this is how expensive and how much money they had going for them. Um, I went down to the prop department and said, hey, you got a flashlight? What's it for? Well, I'm doing it because I was in costume. Oh, I'm doing a scene and they want me to have a flashlight. So I said, yeah. So he hands me a flashlight. I didn't... <clears throat> I didn't bother to ask if it had batteries. <laughs> or even if it was a but real flashlight. When he handed it to me, I clicked it on, and it had batteries in it already. Nice. And then I said, okay, thanks. And I, and I just walked, you know. <laughs> but to just walk up to a, a you know, prop department in Hollywood, and to just say, hey, you got a flashlight? Yeah. Well, give me one. You know, <laughs> what, do you, what do you need it for? Yeah, I got it for a scene. Okay. Boom, and they would have you. Because if it's not on the list of things for this movie, they, they don't have, you know, they just yeah. very, you know, parsimonious. That's so, awesome. But they just sent, you know, everything. No his art. They just <laughs> sent it out there. It sounds like <laughs> Escape so, from Alcatraz was a once in a lifetime experience and you definitely got oh, a lot out of it. Oh man, I just I, I was it was just great watching Clint, you know, yeah. prepare for his scenes by lifting barbells. Dumbbells. He brought 50 pound dumb, dumbbells to the set every day. Or I guess he left them there in his dressing room. But he would bring them out and put them next to the camera, two dumbbells, 50 pounds each. Wow. I tried to pick them up, man. I nearly <laughs> broke my back. <laughs> I thought, well, you know, he just picks them up and he just, you know, I guess pumping up for the scene. Yeah. I, I guess, you know, little verisimilitude, you know, I guess prisoners are always lifting weights. He wanted to be pumped, you know, he's a prisoner. Yeah. You no, know, he just he would just go bump 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 before the scene, and then he'd say, "Okay, you know, Mister Mister Eastwood, you're up. Okay, put it down." So I went over and I go, <laughs> 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 "Oh wow, uh, yeah, that's." That's a great story. I want to thank you so much for coming on here and just sharing some of your stories. They've been great to listen to. I can't believe 30 minutes have passed. It's been awesome just to hear just some of your experiences. Oh, well, I got, I got a, a commercial. I got, I got an ad. I want to just tell you. In, in, uh, in, uh, in October, I, I wrote a book about my adventures in Hollywood, you know, mm -hmm. making these movies and the fights I had and the discombobulation. So it's called That Guy because everybody knows me as that guy. And uh, you, it, so it's it'll be on Amazon, but it's that guy. Look out for it, and you can get it in pre-sale. I guess in August. I told you. Handing out cards and stuff. And that it's guy. is so, it is it coming out this summer? In October. Awesome, but, awesome. But, but in August, you can you can pre-order pre it. So guys, it's look out great. for that. That guy by Larry Hedkin, and I'm sure you yeah. have. A, it's filled with a lot it's of great really stories. Funny. It's great. Awesome. Larry, thank you so much. I want to thank our audience who's tuned in live and those of you who will watch this later on. On behalf of Larry Hankin and myself, guys, stay safe and stay walking. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.